These are the six things that I wish I knew about investing in my 20s. If I had known what I know now back then, I could have easily saved myself from thousands of dollars of losses and honestly potentially put tens of thousands of more into gains. The lessons come into two parts. The first three lessons are things that I would generally look to avoid doing. The second part, we'll talk about the three lessons that I should have implemented sooner. Lesson one, everybody in the world of investing thinks that they have a secret sauce to pick a winner. But at the end of the day, the lesson is that I should have never tried to pick a winning stock or a winning company because that is 100% a fool's errand. This applies both to fundamental as well as technical analysis. Here's what I mean by that. When somebody is using fundamental analysis to try to pick a winning stock, what they're basically trying to do is find the intrinsic value that a company might have based on its present condition as well as future prospects. Simply put, someone is looking at a company today and figuring out, hey, is this over or undervalued based on what I think it could do in the future? And then you either buy or sell based off of that. The majority of investors today, for the most part, use fundamental analysis. One of the most famous ones is Warren Buffett. But the challenge and the issue with fundamental analysis is the fact that we only have so much present information today and we can only have so much foresight into the future. For example, let's think about the darling companies of the past. Ford, General Motors, IBM. In their heyday, they were titans of their industry, but yet where are they today? If you asked your grandparents or your parents, they would have thought there is no way a Ford, a General Motors, or an IBM would be anything but a dominant player in the markets, but today they're trading on a fraction of what they used to be. Now let's go back to Warren Buffett, or more famously, the person Warren had studied under and worked for, Benjamin Graham, who wrote what I would call is probably the Bible on fundamental analysis, the book known as The Intelligent Investor. Benjamin Graham in 1976 reflected back on his his career, on his work, and pretty much summed it up by saying that he actually doubted the fact that a lot of the things he talked about in his book, The Intelligent Investor, when it comes to going in and really analyzing companies to find value, he pretty much called it out that he doesn't think it's applicable anymore today. And keep in mind, that was in 1976. When I read that, that gave me so much pause because here's the person that probably had some of the most profound impact on one of the most successful investors of our time, Warren Buffett, but in 1976 pretty much said, hey, everything that's in my book sure was applicable, in the 20s and 30s, but I don't think it's applicable anymore today in 1976. For us, that was 50 years ago. I'm not gonna call into question Warren Buffett's success, but we also have to understand one key thing, and it's the fact that Warren Buffett is very much a tail event. But for us everyday investors, what we largely are gonna fall into is that middle distribution of the bell curve versus the tail end event. On the other side of it are the folks who are using technical analysis. And these are the folks that are looking at stock charts and they're looking for patterns that they've seen repeated in the past, hopefully to get out ahead of it and to buy or sell and make a profit. Now, the issue with technical analysis is largely the fact that a lot of stock motion is random and it's reliant on your ability to read crowd psychology. And trust me, I've been enamored by it just like everyone else. I still remember watching those day trading YouTube videos where someone's making a thousand dollars a day because they saw a head and shoulders, knees and toes pattern and voila. But the issue though with that is yes, in the short term, you can absolutely make some trades that are gonna deliver, but in the long term, you're gonna fail to consistently beat out the market. And an interesting story was told by Burton McKeel, hopefully I'm saying that right, who's the author of one of my favorite investing books called A Random Walk Down Wall Street. When Burton was teaching at Princeton, he had some students in an economics class take out a coin, heads and tails, and they would just flip it. Then he would have them chart what happened. So this theoretical company started out, I believe, trading at $50. And if it was heads, it would go up a dollar. If it was tails, it would go by, down by a dollar. They would flip, 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 flip. And at the end of it, he then took that chart to some of his friends, some of his colleagues who were conducting technical analysis on various stock charts. He gave it to them and didn't give them a company name. And guess what? They read it as a chart. The random coin flip of heads, tails, heads, tails somehow plotted out something that looked like a chart and they started calling out various patterns. And that to me is a really interesting example because this is nothing. This is random noise, but you can read it however you want to read into it. And so the challenge though with that is the fact that everyone is always going to think that they have some sort of edge in recognizing a pattern here, a pattern there. And when the markets are trading well and there's a lot of volatility, sure, you can go in, you can scoop up some gains. But at the end of the day, if we think about the fact that an investment time horizon is 30, 40, or 50 years, that's gonna be very difficult to replicate. And trust me, the folks who are making the most money day trading are the folks who are also selling you the courses on day trading. Lesson number two, if the professionals on Wall Street fail to consistently beat the market every single year, why do I think I have a chance? The answer is, 
I don't. See, that's the thing. Even the pros on Wall Street, who have all of the data, who are some of the smartest minds in the world, cannot consistently and reliably beat a market index year over year. In fact, I believe there's a statistic out there that 70 or 80% of them fail to beat their market index. So then what chance do I, little John, a retail investor, have of beating the market? The answer is, I don't have any business playing in there. Here's a chart that looked at mutual funds over a 25 year period. And we compared these mutual funds against the overall broader market of the S&P 500. And we can see here, these mutual funds managed by the pros returned about 8.55% over a 25 year time horizon. Not bad. But the S&P 500 itself, if you were just being the market, returned 9.69%. So there's a 1% premium in pretty much just doing not very much. Lesson three, not taking a long-term view to investing, but really just looking in the short term. So pretty much every day you open up your computer and if you go and check the markets, you're gonna have some sort of reaction. If it's green, you feel good. If it's red, you feel, oh my gosh. And this type of reaction is just inherent in human nature. However, that hurts you because you attribute way too much weighting to what's happening in the short term. When the market drops by half a percent or 1%, it's red everywhere and you're thinking, oh my gosh, this is it, the market's crashing, there's no more upside. But if we go back to every single market crash where it felt like the world was ending, whether it's in the 80s, the 90s, the 2000s, heck, just in 2020, we see that no, the market in fact does recover in that the path of progress is for the most part up and to the right. But this phenomena of myopic loss aversion makes us inherently biased towards the negative in the short term and only extrapolating that out. How that impacts you is you make very irrational decisions, myself included, looking at only the short term, not thinking, hey, what is the year 20? 30 look like, 2040, 2050, 2060. Because right now I believe the S&P 500 is at 43, 4400. But why couldn't it ever be at 8,000, 9,000, 10,000? See, even just saying that sounds scary, but not too long ago, the S&P 500 was trading under 2,000, under 1,000. And I can't forget the loss aversion part, and that is basically us as humans, we tend to hate losing something more than we like winning something. There have been tons of experiments done, but basically the idea of loss aversion is you would hate losing $50 more than you would love winning $50. It's weird, but it's just a thing, and we're just gonna accept that. And so when the markets are down, and we see our portfolios are down a percentage or 2%, we think, oh my gosh, this is it. And then you irrationally react. You might sell out early, all to just miss the recovery. Whereas what you should have done all along is probably check less, and also just understand that you, unfortunately, are subject to this all-powerful loss aversion, and you're gonna do irrational behavior. Now we're in the back half, and these next three lessons are things that I would have tried to implement a lot sooner. Lesson number four, don't analyze or rather overanalyze and get caught up in the hype of the newest blah. Instead, just be the market and you'll be fine. So I remember it must have been 2016 or 17 at the time, and I had just learned about this idea of IPO investing. And I'm thinking, wow, that sounds great. You know, a company gets listed, you buy low, you sell high, make a bunch of money. At the time, GoPro was IPOing. I was like, well, I understand GoPro. I've got a GoPro camera. I'm in. And so I remember buying into the GoPro IPO. I must have bought it when it was $40 a share or something, and I dropped $5,000. I'm like, here you go, here's my ticket to riches. I maybe bought in at 40, maybe shot up to 50 or 60, and I'm like, here we go, here we go, here we go. But then shortly after, it went this way. And I was like, well, it's gotta recover, right? It's GoPro, I mean, that's what happens. You know, it goes up, it goes down, but it goes back up. Folks, it never recovered. I had no idea what the heck I was doing with this IPO investing. I saw a YouTube video on it, it sounded cool, made sense, win it. But fundamentally, there were a lot of issues with GoPro that I just didn't know, all right? And so I ended up losing about $4,000 on that trade. Had I instead put $5,000 into a low cost index fund, I would have made a multiple of that in the same type of period that I held onto the GoPro stock, hoping that one day it would just rebound. It never did. And similarly, what I should have done with a lot more of my money is instead of trying to jump into all of these various companies that I didn't really understand that much about, but I was on Seeking Alpha, trying to read their 10Ks, 10Qs, investor relations, all of that, I should have just not wasted all that time and taken all of that and just put it into a low cost index fund and I largely would have been okay. Lesson five, cut the fees as early as possible. The fact of the matter is, if you and I accept the fact that we will never beat the market and that all we need to do is be the market, well, we understand that the market historically, on average, returns anywhere from eight to 10%. But the only thing that stands in the way between us getting to that eight to 10% return 
our fees. And what really solidified it for me is the idea that not only are my returns going to compound year over year, so if you pay some sort of investment manager or a financial advisor a 1% or 2% fee every single year, well, as time goes on and as your portfolio grows, that expense compounds. And let me drive that home with another point. Let's assume that each of us are gonna invest $5,000 a year over the next 40 years, and we average an 8% return. If I invested my money in just a low-cost index fund and I didn't give it to anyone to do anything fancy, but you, on the other hand, decided to give your money to someone, they did fancy things, and they charge you a 2% fee, I would walk away at the end of 40 years with close to about $1.2 million or so in returns. You, on the other hand, would have the same returns except for the 2% fee that compounded, which means what you would see in the bank is closer to $770,000. That's absolutely insane. And the crazier part is the financial advisor largely is probably putting your money into index funds. And so why not just capture all those returns for yourself versus paying someone else? The other side of the equation is when someone comes at you with exotic investments, basically telling you, hey, we're actively managed, we're doing the razzle dazzle spazzle because you're gonna get X. Well, also keep in mind that anything that's actively managed is gonna cost more money. And sometimes those fees are gonna eat away at those returns. So if someone is promising you that they're gonna beat the market by 2%, which probably they can't, but regardless, if they're gonna beat the market by 2%, they might have a fee on the back end that also scoops out an additional 2%. And so you might just end up being just net neutral anyway. Lesson number six, what I should have been doing from the onset. Check less. Stocks, it's not ESPN. We do not need to be watching CNBC every day for the ups and the downs and the secret picks and the this and the that. It's all bullshit, to be perfectly honest. For all of us that are in our 20s and 30s, we have until 50, 60, 70. And so for those 20, 30, 40 years, just check less. Remember earlier we talked about the fact that we are emotional creatures and that we have this loss aversion and we do irrational things? The more we check, the less money we make. Why? Well, let me ask you this. When you see that the markets are in free fall and things are red, what do you immediately want to do? Oh, I don't know, I should sell. And then when you see, oh my gosh, everything is going up, 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 what do you want to do? Oh, I should probably start throwing some money in. But what should really be happening is, when things are on the down and down, you should probably consider buying. And when things are on the up and up, you should probably still consider buying, but you shouldn't be buying any more than you otherwise would have. This principle is known as dollar cost averaging, but the net of all of that is, you shouldn't let outside factors influence your day-to-day -day decisions when it comes to investing. Listen, Investing is boring as shit, trust me. It really shouldn't be all that exciting. What it should be is once a month, once a quarter, you go in, how are things? Oh look, my portfolio still exists, great. And that's it, you're moving on to the next day. Folks who check their investment portfolio less, basically not every day, not every minute, tend to actually come out further ahead, not so much that they're just geniuses at picking stocks, but that they're not as impacted by the day-to-day -day emotions that someone who otherwise is flipping second by second might end up taking some sort of decision that is gonna be a net negative impact. Whew. Folks, that's it. These are the six lessons I wish I knew about investing in my 20s. If you have any comments or questions, please comment down below. A little bit different format that we did today, and I would love to hear any of your feedback. If you want me to deep dive more examples, more clarity, whatever that may be, and I'll catch you all on the next video. Peace!